In a previous video, we introduced the idea of pseudocode. So not dealing with an actual programming language, but almost in plain language, saying a set of instructions to be followed in a particular order to turn some input into a corresponding output. So for this pseudocode, I'll say, I want to define two parameters. A has to be a real number and N has to be a positive integer. And if I give it an input X, then N times over, so it'll do this for once, twice, three times, four times, N times. So for I going from one to N, it takes my existing X and replaces it with A multiples of x, a times x. And then eventually, once it's done that n times, it'll spit out the last x. So it'll be x, then a times x, then a times a times x, then a times that, and so on. And it'll do that n times over. So for a simple example, if I say a is 2, this is like a doubling algorithm, and n is 7. So it'll say double the input 7 times over. So if I start with an input of x equals 1, then this will run for n equals 7 times. So it'll say 1, double it to 2, double that to 4 double that to 8, double that to 16, and so on. And then after it's run through this n equals 7 times, it'll stop. It'll say, I've done this 7 times, and my final answer is 128. That's a very, very simple algorithm. I now want to introduce a very different looking algorithm. Also in pseudocode, we start with the same two parameters, a and n, which are a real number and a positive integer respectively. Now I start by setting some index i to be equal to whatever I set the parameter n to be. And then while i is positive, I've got this weird check that if i is odd, I multiply um, x by a and make that my new x. So I replace x with a times x and I replace i with a half of i or the floor of half i. Remember the floor function rounds a real number down to the nearest integer. So it's rounding, but it's never rounding up. So if I've got the floor of an integer, there's no need to round. So the floor of four is four, the floor of 10 is 10, the floor of 307 is 307. But the floor of three and a half is three. The floor of 4.9 is four. The floor of 10.632 is 10. So for a positive real number, the floor is just ignore the decimal part and take the whole number part. And if I is positive, then I replace A with A times A. And I output X. So that's much more confusing to see what it's doing, or at least I think so. But I'll check this and I'll check this with the same parameters I had before in the previous, I think, simpler algorithm using a is 2 and n is 7. That if I input x equals 1, what do I get? Well, I input um, x is 1 and I start with setting i equal to n, which is 7. So I start with an i of 7 and x of 1 and I set a to be two. So cycling through this, i is positive, so the while loop holds, and i is odd, because i is seven. And because of 
of that. I replace x with two lots of x. So I replace the x with two on the next line. And I replace i on the next line with i over two, or the floor of i over two. So seven over two is three and a half. The floor of three and a half is three. So i shifts from seven to three. X shifts from one to two. And I is positive, so I replace A with A times A. So A shifts from 2 to 2 times 2 is 4. So my second line is 3, 2 and 4 for I, X and A respectively. So I'm still triggering my while loop because I is still positive. So I say, OK, I've got an I of 3. So I is odd, so I replace X with A times X. So a times x is 4 times 2, so I'm going to have 8 on my next line down. I'm going to replace i with i over 2 floor. So the floor of 3 over 2 is the floor of 1.5 is 1. So i drops to 1. x jumps up to 8. i is positive, so I replace a with a times a. So I replace 4 with 4 times 4 is 16. And then on the next line, I've got i is odd. So I replace x with 8 times x. I replace uh, 8 with 16 times 8. And I replace i with the floor of 1 over 2. The floor of a half is 0. So i drops to 0. x is 128. I is not positive, so the if doesn't do anything to A. And I output the X now because I stop, because I don't go around the while loop anymore because I has gone to zero. So I don't need to go around the loop again and I stop with an output of 128. Now that's no coincidence. That's actually doing the same job of raising, um, in this case, multiplying my input by a to the power n. It's just doing it much more efficiently. So both of those two algorithms I saw previously calculated my input one multiplied by my, I suppose, multiplier a equals 2 to the power of n equals 7. So they both calculated 1 times 2 to the 7, but one did it in a lot more steps and the second one in a lot fewer steps. And if I set it an even larger power to calculate, I would see the efficiency difference, the speed difference. So if I ask the first algorithm to calculate a to the power of 20 for some a, it would take 20 steps to do that because it would do a, a times a, a times a times a, a times a times a times a. So each time I increase the power, I add one additional step. Because that's what I would get for an input of x equals 1, then I would just get this multiply by a, by a, by a, by a, 20 times. So it would get there, but it would not get there very quickly or very efficiently. If I applied the same argument to the second case to try and calculate a to the power 20 there, it would get there much, much more quickly. So rather than taking um, 20 different steps, I'd have i of 20, drops to i of 10, drops to i of 5, drops to i of 2, because it halves it and indeed takes the floor of that halving each time. So it gets to the same answer much, much more quickly. And whilst that only calculating to a 20th power, if I wanted something huge, I really, really want these algorithmic speed-ups where possible. 
So doubling the n in the first algorithm would double the number of steps. If I wanted to do a 40th power, an 80th power, a 160th power, if I double n, I double the number of steps. In the second case, if I double n, I only add one more step because effectively the remaining power halves with each step. So I'd only have one more step to work out a 40th power, two more steps to work out an 80th power. So for small numbers, there isn't a big difference in the algorithm for small powers. For big numbered powers, one of those gets there very slowly. One gets there really, really efficiently. So what we would say, we'd say in the first case, the number of steps taken um, in the first case, it scales with increasing n proportionally to n. And in the second case, it scales proportionally to the logarithm of n. The, the log, in this case, I'll write base 2 because I can write that it halves each time. It adds one more step for each doubling. If I plot those up, I can see that for very small numbers, although I can't see very well because it's sort of squeezed into the bottom left there, but the number of steps there for very large n gets very large under the first algorithm, that the blue line that scales linearly, but that the complexity, the number of steps taken in the second algorithm, even for very large n, does not increase that much. It's a very, very flat line. It's super efficient that even for very big calculations, it does them in barely more steps than for very small n. So we can compare the speed or complexity of algorithm by considering how many steps it takes, which is a proxy for time. How long will it take for the algorithm? to produce the answer and how does that time or that complexity change as the input value n changes. So I'll usually do that by comparing to a simpler function. So in those cases one of them was proportional to n and the other was proportional to the log base 2. 